with Neil Messick of Messick's Farm Equipment, right? What's the, what's your, what's the name of your dealership? Uh, we go by Messick's a lot of the time, just use our last name. You probably know Messick's from his YouTube channel. You've got, what, almost 35,000 subscribers uh, now? Right about 35,000. I've got, like you, probably 300 and some videos up online now. And a lot of interesting stuff. If you're a beginner in the compact tractor world, Neil does a terrific job of explaining just some basics about compact tractors. Now, one thing I notice about Neil is he kind of leans a little bit toward that orange direction, just a little bit, but we'll not hold that against you too much. No, no I, I think you've certainly got a green slant going on here too, Tim, so yeah. we, we might have to duke that out here at some point. I don't know, we'll see what happens. Well, we'll try to, we'll try to keep it friendly, at least for today. Neil, how could you help us decide what tractor to buy? <laughs> so Tim, one of, the, one of the things I've enjoyed with you so far that we've been at is, is batting back and forth on the green versus orange stuff. You know, we, we can have fun joking about that kind of stuff, but one of the things that uh, we always try to stress is the value in not just buying a brand tractor, but also the relationship that you're going to be building with a dealership um, and the value that a dealer brings to the equation. So a lot of guys often think that buying a tractor is kind of like buying a car. You know, you, you go in, you make your, your purchase, and you may never go back to that place again. And with a tractor, that's so often not the case. You're going back for service and attachments, and you're building a relationship with that shop over a period of time. So if you got a minute today, I'm going to give you a quick walk around and maybe show you some of the ways that I see that being a valuable thing to a customer. What, what are you looking for when you're evaluating that dealership? Okay, well let's do it. Maybe a little bit of behind the scenes at Messix. <laughs> Generally, your first interaction when you go to buy a tractor is gonna be with the dealership sales department. Um, we'd have a bunch of guys back here in our shop that are broken up into different product categories or we have product experts on the different equipment that we sell. Uh, but when you go in and you start that relationship, you, you definitely wanna be getting the warm fuzzies from the, the salesman that you're working with. Is he you know, trying to sell the tractor that's right for you or is he trying to sell the tractor that he has sitting out in the parking lot that it needs to go. Is he paying attention to your needs? Is he following up? Is he calling back and those kinds of things? And yeah, does he know the product? Line? Does he know the product? And, and that first touch is often going to be reflective of maybe your experience there as a customer, right? Is that the kind of attitude that you're going to get from the parts department, the service department? In your case, you sell a lot of breadth of equipment. All the we way do. From little tractors, probably even lawn mowing equipment. We'll, we'll sell you a push mower or we'll sell you a combine, you know, and, and anywhere in between. And so that's a little bit of why I said we break our sales guys up into particular product segments because uh, those two salesmen certainly aren't going to be knowledgeable across those breadth of industries and that breadth of product. You know, a typical hey, tractor salesman uh, receives a surprising amount of training. Training. They're typically going to schools every year. They're attending dealer meetings. Um, there's a lot of education that goes into this. If you find a new tractor salesman, it takes these guys usually a good year, year and a half before they start to become knowledgeable about the breadth of brands and products and processes and really start to grasp what they're doing. So during the sales process, am I going to meet anyone else? It, oftentimes, yes. Now, in our case, that usually comes towards the end of the sales process, right? When you're actually buying that oh, tractor, it's okay. really okay. good so if the salesman the goes and introduces you to the parts department and the service department. Because we were talking about that relationship, right? They're handing you off to the people that are going to take care of you in the future. Okay, well, let's go meet some of them. Cool. So we're in the parts department now. Uh, we're down here at the counter, yep. Yeah. yeah, and I see, what is this, a head? That is a head. This is your head. Yep. What's that <laughs> off of? An LX865. Okay. Parts department, we're going to deal with complex things like that. Or even the simple stuff like WD-40 specialist rust release penetrant spray. I suggest they get a simpler name for it. I'm glad to see you selling this stuff. This is good stuff. <laughs> So what am I going to do with the parts guy? With the parts guy. So so you will likely see the parts guy at some point, right? And you may not think that you're going to the parts counter when you're buying a new tractor, but it is inevitable at some point you will have a leaky hydraulic coupler or a switch that gets water in it. Those kinds of things are kind of normal in a tractor ownership experience. Again, you mentioned that it's not like owning a car. I mean, cars are so refined. They've sold so many of them. Well, tractors, are, there's a lot 
more complexity and a lot smaller space. Sure, uh, complexity in the space and you know our tractors are engineered better and better all the time and they, they get better in a lot of those ways, but you're not using them in the same way either, right? You're not taking your car and crashing it into a tree stump when you're trying to knock it out of the ground, right? Exactly so right. <laughs> so the, the use of those machines is very, very different. So most customers will at some point have some kind of interaction with their parts department to replace the things that are broke and also to service the machine, right? At, you might take your car into the stop and go every 3,000 miles to get a new oil filter, but for a lot of our tractors, guys do a lot of that work themselves. Um, so you're coming in for the filters and the fluids and that kind of stuff. So you'll find a good knowledgeable parts guy is really worth his weight in gold. The, the difference between somebody who's had the proper training and the time and the inventory to back them up um, is really, really significant uh, versus maybe the, the high school kid that might be standing back there for starting. Very important. And sometimes you go in and you don't have a part number. Yeah. Sometimes you go in with a part on a machine that they don't even stock that part on. A good parts man can sometimes find you an exact fit from a totally different machine. It's it's amazing. Yeah. Neil, you've got aisle after aisle of parts here. <laughs> we do. We, we stock a lot, a lot of parts. Uh, you know, parts is a, a two-faceted department for us, right? You, you've got those frontline parts guys that are helping you find the right parts, but there is a really significant amount of logistics work that goes into making sure a dealership is stocking the right parts, because oftentimes when you need something, you want it now. You don't want to be waiting for it, right? Um, so in our case, we stock about 88,000 different types of individual parts. To give you an idea of how many that is, you'll find some small tractor manufacturers that probably have 25 to 30,000 parts in their entire catalog. Wow. Um, but in the case of the breadth of equipment that we sell, you'll find 88,000 different lines here, about $15 million worth of inventory that we're sitting on in order, in order to supply our customers. Um, you can get a good idea of what your dealerships look like when you walk in. You can kind of peer behind the counter and, and partly see how much is back there, right? You're gauging that. But at the same time, you're looking for organization and cleanliness and that kind of stuff is really going to tell you how well that dealership is managing their parts department. And do they care, right? Do they look at that part of their business as being important in, in valuing the product support side of what their customers need? Very good point. What's next, Neil? Uh, we'll head back here to the service shop. Do you have the antiques in here? A lot of the guys here are in the antique tractors. A lot, a lot of our mechanics and service managers and that kind of stuff. We've got one service manager back here has about 70, oh 70 antique tractors. You go to the tractor fairs and stuff in the, the fall, he's got half the machines out there all belong to him. Yeah. Okay, we're in the service bay now, and this is one busy place, Neil. Yeah, there's. Uh, we have 32 service technicians out here right now, I believe. Um, you know, you're looking at the value of where you're going to buy your piece of equipment from. You want to gauge what happens when it breaks. Um, and so looking into a dealer service department and seeing, you know, are they busy? Are they doing stuff? Are they working on equipment? Whose equipment are they working on? Um, is it clean and organized? And those kinds of things are going to tell you, you know, what kind of experience you may have if your machine goes in for warranty work. Or so if I'm going to buy a tractor from you, you're, you're not going to have a problem if I ask to see your service department and do the walkthrough that we've done. No, I mean, just like we do today. Um, do we do this with customers all the time? No, it, it takes a while. But um, absolutely. I mean, you want to go back and take a look at the back and see what's going on. Um, I don't consider that inappropriate at all. we got to be careful sometimes of where we go depending on what's going on. And obviously, there's equipment running around. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's part of the process. Interview the dealership that you're buying. That's what I'm doing. Um, this, uh, yeah, should, should be together, not apart, right? <laughs> so unfortunately, in this case, this guy ripped out his four-wheel drive propeller shaft. Um, but uh, things happen, and it, you can see how this thing is torn apart. Um, a, a service technician's job is difficult, right? There is a lot of knowledge that these guys need to have to be able to pull these things apart, put them back together properly, and do it in a timely fashion. Um, I, this is one of those careers right now that so needs more people, right? There are fantastic job opportunities and learning to do this work. Yeah, there's uh, so much discussion about college this, college that, but there is good money to be made. Yeah. Very fascinating to do this type of work. It's, it's fascinating work, it's awesome engineering, it's really cool technology. Um, their job opportunities are ones that pay really, really well. I, I, love to see more people in it. Right now we would hire eight to ten service technicians today if we could. 
there's just not enough people in this industry. Christy, you need another job? <laughs> I'm busy right now. But... We might put another wrench in your pocket here before yeah. you leave. I'll keep uh, you in mind. But again, when you're interviewing your dealership, take a look at what they're doing. Are their, their service technicians able to do this kind of complex work? Because these are complicated machines in a lot of cases. So this is new equipment setup, right, yep. Neil? Yeah, so in our case, we would break our shop up, like our salesmen, we break our technicians up into different product segments so they're really knowledgeable in what they're working on. Uh, Lee over here has done nothing but set up new tractors for, oh gosh, it's over 30 years at this point. Um, wow. And that's, that's what he does, is set up and prep new Kubotas, one right after the next. Hey Lee, what you, what you building here today? Well, it's the subframe and the snow blower to mount on that VX tractor. Let's hope he doesn't need it. That's right. But if he does, he's ready. <laughs> Hey, it's winter time today, but I notice we're standing in front of a stack of tillers. We all know when we get outside and we start putting our tractors to work, you know, a tractor is nothing more than a tool carrier in the end, right? You've got to have those attachments to be able to get your chores done. When you're thinking about a tractor, don't forget all the attachments because a tractor by itself, even with a loader, is not incredibly useful, right? I mean, you, you've got to have something to put on it. What is your favorite attachment for a compact tractor? Uh, favorite? We saw a lot of tillers, a lot of guys find a lot of varied uses for tillers, right? You can use it for gardens and that kind of stuff, but also for reseeding and lawn prep and that kind of thing. So I, I really like them for that. Um, more recently, one of the things that I've got pretty excited about is uh, push boxes and stuff for loaders. Now we're in an area that gets a significant amount of snow. And so we're starting to see some of those industrial minded snow attachments being sized for subcompacts now. So that's been kind of a cool new thing. Um, and land planes. I, a lot of these attachments take some skill to use, right? When you yeah. throw something in the back of your tractor, it's difficult to be an expert out yes. of the gate. Yes. A land plane, though, is one of those things that we can give to just about anybody, and they can get some really good results really quickly. So that's been a neat thing lately, too. Interesting. I, I have seen that. I think I'd like to have one of those. I've got a, now I have an eighth of a mile stone, crushed stone driveway. Yeah. And I think a land plane would really help me. Tim, I'm going to find one here for you today. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> I may have to take one home. And you talked about the snow pusher. I just recently did a video on a snow pusher. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I like about the snow pusher, it doesn't take any hydraulics. Right. Right? It can use your quick attach. Yep. Whether it be the uh, skid steer quick attach or what was it you said the other video recently? Uh, proprietary. The proprietary. proprietary. I love to make fun of Deer's proprietary things, Tim. <laughs> Maybe we'll have to have a little rebuttal on that at some point. But anyway, the snow push really just, it hooks onto your quick attach and you go. You don't have to have a third function. I noticed that when you when you push up a pile of snow, you don't have to take the time to tilt the, the mm -hmm. bucket to dump it. And you know, on a subcompact, I don't care what color it is, it takes a while for that bucket to, yeah. to tilt. It really slows you down. So it really, it really helps on the speed on that. Yeah. So what else? Uh, you know, why don't we go for a walk here a little bit? We have Let's do a that. fair amount of stuff outside. Let's go find some unique things to show them off. Let's do that. Wow, look at all this stuff. <laughs> There's a pile toys, of it. toys, toys. There's a pile of it. <laughs> do you sell trailers? I need a I need a trailer to haul all this stuff home. Oh uh, yeah. No, we can put you out there too. Grapples, land planes, landscape rakes. Coastal digger is everybody's favorite. Coastal <laughs> diggers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll have to check out our video about the post hole digger. Uh, it works. It's the best way to dig a hole with a compact tractor, but it's not pleasant. No, and absolutely awful to get on an awful machine. Yes, it is that too. <laughs> Christy, here's the land plane, and it's got, uh, this one has some scarifiers in front, and then it's got a couple of cutting edges in here. Makes it very uh, easy to, to level and smooth your driveway. I think we need one of these. I thought the Kubota machines, you got either a machine with a backhoe or without a backhoe. I'm seeing all these right. backhoes here by themselves. What's, what's so going your, on? So your subcompact tractor, that is how that is. The backhoes are a factory installed option. They come to us already on the machine. Okay. Um, we really like that, particularly for that tractor, because the installation time of these backhoes is really quite significant. Uh, but the subcompact coming through that already on saves us about $600 of installation labor, which then leads to a better price tractor to our customers. Yeah, and I'm sure it's uh, cheaper for the manufacturer to do that. Yes, right there yeah, the roll line. the whole thing out. They don't have to box it up. But in the case of your larger machines, um, you'll see we have a really significant stack of backhoes out here. So a lot of seven and a half foots that we would put on B and L series tractors and some bigger nine and a half foots that will go up on the large L's and small M's. 
Cool products. Uh, one thing that we like about Kubota stuff, uh, the backhoes in particular, is it is all Kubota made products. So everything that you see that is painted orange is coming out of one of their factories. It's not a supplier product. Um, supplier products are something that I get particularly grumbly about. For us as a dealer, we never get as good a pricing and parts support from something that is bought from another third party down the road. So anything where we see the actual manufacturer building the thing always leads to a better customer experience. Look at all these loaders. Seriously, are all these going to be gone by the end of the year? Oh yeah, by mid to end spring of spring, they'll be gone. Turn our inventory like this about twice a year. So for the most part, we'll have five to six months of inventory sitting on the lot. Wow. Um, and this isn't nearly enough. Uh, we would have sold over a thousand Kubotas in this last year. A thousand Kubotas? A thousand Kubotas. I see several Batwing mowers here, Neil. What's mm -hmm. the smallest Batwing that you, that you make? Uh, there's some small ones that we can get from either Woods or Land Pride that they're going to get down into uh, 12 foot for a finish and around 10 foot or so for a, a batwing rotary. It become a popular thing for some of the compact tractor guys once you start to get up into that you know, large compact 60 horsepower or so. Right. You can actually pull something like that and really get some big swaths done very quickly but still be able to fold the thing up into a size that isn't unbearable to store around your property. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I was thinking about. If I could have a 10-foot batwing, yeah. I'd get the, the, the flex and float of a, of a batwing mower. Mm -hmm. I'd also be able to fold it up and still get in an 8-foot trailer. Yes. And uh, and be able you, to transport them. You still you know, trailer them, still transport them. Uh, great mowers will still give you a good cut. A lot of times, not on these particular ones, but a lot of times the decks and stuff on the finish are exactly the same decks that you would have in this, the single deck three-point mounted version. Um, so still a good quality of cut. If there's any downside to a mower like that, they do get a little pricey right when you're buying all those drive lines and gearboxes and that kind of stuff. Yeah, there's... essentially a bat wing's a bat wing. It has all the same equipment as a bigger one. Right. Um, of course, they are built. There's different grades. There's the heavy duties and, and the, sure. the entry. But yep, I think you better put one of those on my list. Okay, uh, your trailer's getting full. Oh. <laughs> I'm saying no. <laughs> Tim, one of the things I really appreciate about your channel is that you really take the opportunity with people to show the work getting done and actually showing a lot of these attachments in use. So, as a dealer, you've made my job easy in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, we do some videos with this kind of stuff, but the more people are able to see, you know, taking that tractor that they have and putting it to work uh, really helps us help everybody who watches your videos understand how to get more done and how to use the tools that we provide. Yeah, well, thank you. And one thing that I like about your videos is how you do a tremendous job of explaining basic feature functionality to someone who's never used a tractor, never had any experience with a tractor. You're articulate, it's just, it's incredible to watch your videos. You do a great job of explaining things. <laughs> Good to hear, appreciate it. <laughs> Check out Neil's channel, it's just called Messix on YouTube. We'll put a link in the description. Yeah, he does kind of feature the wrong color tractor, but we won't <laughs> hold that against him. <laughs> and we thank you for watching everybody, and we'll see you next time on Tractor Time with Tim. Rust release penetrant penetra spray. Easy for me to say, right? Like rust release penitent penitent. Is that that's like some sort of a, a religious term, term, right? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, that's right.